Welcome to Side by Side. Here's a phrase that I've come across in my preparation for our today's Side by Side. Sin is trying to succeed by ignoring reality. Sin is trying to succeed by ignoring reality. Have you ever noticed how the invitation to sin is often an invitation to some deeper longing, and maybe a very good longing, to become someone, to know something, to possess something? It's that longing within us which is a perfectly good longing often, but to go about it in such a way that we ignore what's really going on and what will happen. Things like consequences, what will happen to us. The goal of the foolish here in this chapter, chapter 1, is to have fun. Listen to the words of Proverbs 1, verse 8 and following. My child, listen when your father corrects you and don't neglect your mother's instruction. What you learn from them will crown you with grace and be a chain of honour around your neck. My child, if sinners entice you, turn your back on them. They may say, come and join us. Let's hide and kill someone just for fun. Let's ambush the innocent. Let's swallow them alive like the grave. Let's swallow them whole like those who go down to the pit of death. Think of the great things we'll get. We'll fill our houses with all the stuff we take. Come, throw in your lot with us. We'll share the loot. That's the enticement that's being talked about here. It's prosperity. There's nothing wrong with wanting good things. There's nothing wrong with wanting stuff even in our houses. There's nothing wrong with wanting a sense of joy. But of course, the means to get it can be the wrong means. And that's what's being spoken of here. You notice how wisdom is addressing you and I as my child. And in every case, as we go through the first, first nine chapters of Proverbs, which are more of the introductory chapters before we get to the actual Proverbs themselves, those small penetrating illustrations and examples of life, they all address you as my child. It means that the one who's speaking to you is like a father. Or a mother. That means wisdom desires for us what any true good father would. The motive of wisdom is love. And yet isn't it often the case that when we see Satan and his tempting ways, so often he tries to portray any sense of boundary as a, an, an unjust restriction? Just as in Genesis whenever there was a limit around what was possible for Adam and Eve. The one tree that they were not told to eat of was turned into some sort of a, a miserable restraint, something narrow, cruel and legal. But verses 8 and 9 speak of what this wisdom will do for us. It talks about this wisdom will crown you with grace and it will be a chain of honour around your neck. Isn't it interesting? What wisdom wants for you? And I think in every place where you find the word wisdom here, you could put the word Jesus. Jesus is the wisdom of God. What does he want for you? Well, it's a graceful garland on your head and pendant for your neck, honour and beauty. You know, quite often people will say, some will say in our world, that if you follow the path of Jesus, you're going to look foolish. You're going to look stupid. I'm reminded of the, the story of the young man who was an employee in one of the big firms in London. I think it might have been John Lewis's. And his boss one day asked him to tell a lie because he was the phone had rung and, and the person on the phone was asking for his boss and he told him, tell him I'm not here. And he wouldn't do it. He said, no, he is here. Afterwards, when his boss was so cross with him, he said to him, well, sir, he said, how will you know if I lie for you that someday I'm not going to lie to you? 
Yes, it looked really foolish to do the right thing, to follow the wise course. But when you think about it, it was a very attractive thing. I gather that that young man went on to be a very important person in that company, as you can imagine. To follow the wise path is to follow the gospel path. It's the path that believing and living out the gospel implies. At very core, and it is the loving of God and neighbour, not the loving of self. Now, it's not likely that you're going to be tempted to join a bloodthirsty band to mug or kill someone, as this little section says. But in essence, there will be times when we are faced by some invitation or some choice that seems to offer personal gain in a sort of a way like this, because at the end of the day, that is what it is. It's come and do this, and then you will find fun. Your house will be full of this stuff. Yeah, you see, it's the gain at the end of the day. Come with us, let us lie in wait. Let's work together towards some particular end. Do you know how it can easily happen in other ways? Come, let's gossip about somebody. Let's put them down. And then we'll all feel so much better, won't we? You see, there are lots of ways to take a person down. There are many elaborate, simple ways complex ways, different ways to pull a person apart. And isn't there also in this a veiled invitation to belong here? Come throw in your lot <clears throat> with us and we'll share this sense of community, this longing to be included. It's a good thing. It's actually a godly thing because community was first thought of and it's first evidenced in the very Trinity itself. But in order to find our sense of belonging in this way is a disaster. That's why when we read on, they rush to commit evil deeds. They hurry to commit murder. If a bird sees a trap, it knows to stay away. But these people set an ambush for themselves. They're trying to get themselves killed. Such is the fate of all who are greedy for money. It robs them of life. Our Lord Jesus has won everything that we need, all the promises to meet every heart need, including the need to belong. Sadly, so many don't investigate, they don't associate, or they don't invest themselves in seeing behind the humble picture of Jesus and getting to the amazing glory of who he is, to discover that who he is and what he offers them are the true riches and the real love and the real belonging. You see, the offer of Jesus giving himself for us and to us should make every other offer like, well, a bit look like the difference between cardboard and steak. Really, so obvious that it's not hard to know which one to choose. Because the Lord Jesus is the wisdom that cries aloud on the street. That's the next verse. Wisdom shouts in the street. She cries out in the public square. The Lord Jesus is that wisdom. Our culture has tried so hard to silence him at every turn or to offer a false version, an alternative of where we seem so wise. And how has that helped us in these days? That's what happened at Calvary. Silence the wise and let the human wisdom be heard. Well, how glad we are that God has not let us have our foolish way. As the one true loving Father, his care for his children is seen so clear, his wisdom wins. Well, the question is, has it won your heart? The way of Christ, the way of resting in him and his promises, acting as he says, loving, building, giving, blessing, not stepping on others, but lifting them up. This is really the attractive way. This is the wise way. So let's follow the path of wisdom. Let's listen to the Jesus who is the wise teacher. And let's walk with him through our day. <laughs>